Hello and a very warm welcome to this ICAS webinar. Uh, for those that don't know me, I'm David Mingus, Director of Practice here at ICAS, and it's my great pleasure to be guiding you through this webinar today. I'm quite sure everyone that is on today's webinar started out in their accountancy career for a host of different reasons. However, I'm also sure that the most satisfying element is when we realise that we've helped our clients in one way or another. But for every client, what they value will be different. But how often do we sit down to understand what client values and how can we not only integrate that, but put it at the heart of our firm service? How well do you really know your client? Well, KYC is a term that is well known to us from our AML compliance activities. And if done right, it also provides an opportunity to understand your client's goals and support them in their aspirations. Asking the deeper questions helps provide a more meaningful and valuable offering with tailored services and importantly, chargeable insights. Of course, by delivering a great client experience, you can expect to reap the benefits of word of mouth referrals. But with more business comes growth, which is often difficult to manage and not without risk, especially from a staffing perspective. So is there a framework within which we can put all of this in place and how achievable is that to, uh, to work with? Well, what a better way to understand the issues than to hear from someone who has been through the process and who truly understands the concepts as well as the practicalities. I'm delighted today that we're going to be joined by Will Farnell. Will is, of course, the founder and a director of Farnell Clark Limited, an innovative and pioneering accountancy firm based in East Anglia and London. They offer a fresh approach to SME accountancy and business advisory services. And Farnell Clark was one of the first global firms to fully adopt client, uh, cloud accounting technology and, of course, remains one of the UK's most innovative firms today. Will is well known to many of us and is author of the digital firm, A Blueprint for Digital Transformation. He's a regular speaker on how accounting firms can leverage technology, people and process to achieve practice growth as well as providing consultancy services to support firms in becoming a digital practice. So I'm really looking forward to having Will speak to us uh, shortly. But before I do bring in Will, uh, just a few housekeeping matters to remind everyone of. Um, I would encourage you to get the most out of today's webinar by uh, having your questions answered. And of course, you can submit those at any time through the live Q&A facility, which can be accessed at the bottom of your screen. Questions can be submitted anonymously or only to the presenters of the webinar if you wish. And of course, we won't identify who questions come from when we get to a question and answer session. Please also join the conversation today through the discussion forum, which you can also access at the bottom of your screen. The forum allows you to comment or discuss with fellow attendees on the matters covered by today's webinar. We are, of course, recording the webinar and we'll make it available for on-demand viewing afterwards in case you either want to refer back to it or share, up, share it with others. And you'll be able to find the slides for today's webinar alongside the on-demand video later hours at icast.com forward slash webinars. So as I say, we do look forward to receiving your questions throughout the course of the webinars. And of course, we'll try to get as many as possible. Um, but I'm going to bring Will in just now. Will, um, absolutely great to, to have you join us uh, again today. Uh, I know you and I last met back in May at the ICAST Digital Practice Conference in Glasgow, where you were one of uh, a fantastic panel of speakers that we had on that day. Um, I, I suspect that was perhaps the first time you had um, encountered a large number of the ICAST members and firms. Um, I guess, you know, what, what was your impressions of the day and what, what did you take away from it? Uh, that, firstly, thank you for, for inviting me to, to join you again, David. We had a we had a fabulous session uh, in in May with the the, the sixty seventy or so uh, accountants yeah. that, that that joined us, and and I think yes, you're right. It was the first time I've uh, uh, spent uh, a day with uh, that many uh, ICAS members, um, uh, but it was a fantastic day. I think everybody took. Uh, some really valuable learnings from from the session, uh, and clearly it was one of the reasons we said let's let's do something uh, on on webinar to to kind of get those messages across to a to a 
broader audience. Um, yep. Hopefully, we've got some people in the uh, uh, in the audience today that were at that session um, and have taken some action from the things that that we we talked about during the day. But I'm really looking forward to kind of sharing uh, the thinking again to uh, to everybody here uh, with us this yeah. morning. Yeah, that, 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 that's great. Yeah, as, as you said, we had a, a lot of great sessions dur during that day. Um, and I guess just a, a, a reminder to, to, to anyone that did miss out on the, the, the live session, uh, we do have uh, every session available on demand to view on via the ICAST website. So uh, do head across back to the, the ICAST website after the end of this webinar, of course, not during it. <laughs> um, and and just, just do a search for, if you just search for Digital Practice Conference 2023, uh, you'll be able to, to access the, the the recordings, but you know one of the topics we we, we talked about the, the the conference will was uh, what it is to create a digital practice and uh, how you as a firm have come somewhat full circle uh, to evolve yes. back beyond a digital practice to what you now term uh, the the human firm. Um, yes. But as with all the conferences, we only ever really get to scratch uh, the surface of the topics, and that's why I think it's it's, it's great that we're able to. Uh, look at that again today and as you say take take that on a bit for a bit further and um, yeah. so I, I know you've got an awful lot to to, to cover so um, I'll, I'll just hand over to you to, to to crack on with that just now thank you David and um, so uh, again good uh, uh, good morning everybody uh, it's a pleasure to uh, to be here with you uh, this morning and um, so we we decided that we're going to tackle two key areas here but they're, they're, they're completely interlinked um, David did a fantastic introduction there in terms of setting the scene for what we're going to talk about. And so many of the things are, are part of a system. And uh, David talked about the move to being a digital firm, which is something we did many years ago now. But I'll talk about what that journey looked like and, and where it's ended up being now. Um, and I wrote my first book, The Digital digital firm in 2018 uh, and earlier this year I published a second book uh, which is called The Human Firm and the idea really is thinking that that we we need to humanize what we do in a world where technology uh, is now available to us all um, it's not the USP it used to be the thing that differentiates what we do is our people um, it's the teams that we have and it's the way that we interact with our clients so what The Human Firm explores and we're going to cover off today is how do we balance, how do we get that balance right between the focus on our clients and the focus on the goals, aspirations of, of the people that we employ within our teams to service those clients? So much of what we do is about creating great experiences. If you want to grow an accounting firm or a bookkeeping firm, you need to be delivering great services. So we're going to talk a bit about client experience, what that means, but also this idea of going from know your client to really knowing your client. And David touched on the point that we all understand KYC. And when we think about KYC, we talk about AML and risk profiling and, and all of those statutory things that we have to do. But where my thinking started on this is if we look at what um, wealth managers or independent financial advisors do when they do KYC, is they ask the pertinent questions. They ask, when do you want to retire? How much do you need when you retire? When do you want to pay your mortgage off? Do you want to send your children to private school? And they build solutions to solve those problems or challenges or aspirations that clients have. And that's what we need to do when we think about KYC. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. But ultimately, if we get that bit right, if we deliver great experiences for clients, we're going to grow. And it's really easy to grow an accounting firm, but it's much harder to scale an accounting firm. So we're going to talk about some of the things that we've done as a business in terms of putting in the foundations to enable us to scale successfully and equally unsuccessfully in terms of the things that we've got wrong. So in terms of what we're going to, uh, uh, to, to cover off uh, today, um, I'm going to do some introductions. I'm going to introduce myself just in case uh, uh, you, you don't know my background. Um, I'm going to talk about this process that we went through, through being a digital firm to being a human firm. We're going to talk about client experience and how we increase client experience through more frequent touch points and some of the ways that we build those, those touch points and how we begin to think about growth and scale. Um, we'll touch a bit more on, on why knowing your client isn't enough and we have to get to really know our clients. And then we're going to bring it all together in terms of 
what do I really mean when I talk about the human firm? Now, we've got a se section for questions and answers at the end, but I've, I've already said to David, if you pop questions into the uh, Q&A box as we go through the session, um, David has uh, uh, carte, carte blanche to in interrupt me and ask those questions while they're relevant because it may be something that's relevant to a point that I've just mentioned. So do put those questions in. Um, if the time is right to uh, to pick them up as we go through the session, we'll do that. Uh, failing that, we'll pick them up at the end of, uh, end of the session. Um, so uh, as David said, I set up Final Clark in 2007. Um, uh, I set the business up uh, with um, a very clear purpose. And in, in the human firm, I talk about the power of purpose. And I had a very clear idea um, uh, of what I wanted to do because I looked at the way professional services were delivered, particularly accountancy services, and I felt that there was a better way. And I felt that we, we owe it to clients to deliver the kind of services that they need and, and should expect. So it was quite a grandiose uh, objective, um, me sitting in my garage in my back garden uh, on my own um, uh, with a, a desire to change the way professional services were delivered and the way that those services are perceived by the people that use them. So on the back of that, I put myself in the shoes of a client and said, look, if I'm buying accountancy services, what do I want? What's important to me? And we did a bunch of things that in 2007 were, were quite novel, less so today. But that was down to simple things like transparency around pricing. So let's tell people what they're going to what they're going to be charged and what they get for it. And let's charge that on a monthly basis. Let's collect it by direct debit or standing order as it was when we first started. We made a conscious decision that, that wearing a shirt and tie didn't make us a better accountant. So, so much of what we did in terms of positioning and language, the way we charged for services, the way we positioned what we did was quite novel uh, in, in a profession 16, 17 years ago. But equally, the internet was kind of a bit of a thing uh, in 2007. And for me, I thought there has to be a better way than accessing data that's locked on a computer in a dark corner of an office that only one person has the key to. And if we're lucky as accountants, we get the key six months after the year end. So I spent a long time looking for something that I thought should exist um, and, and eventually came across a product called Cashflow. Um, we partnered with Cashflow in 2008. Um, by the middle of 2009, we were their largest partner firm, which wasn't overly difficult in 2009. But by the end of 2009, every client we got was using Cashflow, which probably made us the first 100% based cloud practice globally um, uh, very early on. So we've lived and breathed tech. And as a business, we've delivered about 30% year on year revenue growth every year for the best part of 15 years, which is great, but it's also very painful and it's challenging. Um, so, so that's kind of the firm. Uh, I wrote the digital firm in 2018 and I wrote the human firm earlier this year. A um, couple of other things that I do, uh, I uh, co-founded a business called App Advisory Plus, which is about helping accountants choose the right technology for, for them and, and their clients. And I'm very lucky now that I get the opportunity to, to speak and mentor and work with accountancy firms, um, uh, not just in the UK, but, uh, but around the world. So uh, uh, very fortunate for the opportunity to share our earnings and the things that, that we've done well, but most importantly, the things that we got wrong. So let's uh, let's get uh, into the session. And, and uh, this is on the back of my book, um, because we're hearing lots at the moment around the idea that are we are we going to be replaced by robots? And the answer to that is yes, if we act like them. So we have to think about what we do and think about the things that we can do that the robots can't that create that uniqueness to what we do and keep us relevant in what we do. So much of that is about human. It's about the human interactions we have. It's the, the, the emotional intelligence. It's the, the empathy and all of the things that we should be delivering for all of the clients that, that we serve. So this is a bit of a journey. Um, and I've touched upon uh, our story as a business. And, and in 2009, we were, uh, we were what was um, termed as online accountants. And it was a derogatory term. So our local uh, competitors had a view of what it meant in terms of what we were doing with technology. And the view was that we didn't care about clients. 
all we wanted to do was do it as cheaply as we could because remember this is 2008 2009 very early stages of of online retail and so we got positioned in the way that uh, uh, that the Amazons of this world uh, were in that it's just about doing it cheap and you don't want client contact and so on. The reality, though, was the polar opposite. The reason that we did it is because we did care about clients. I wanted access to my client's data 24-7 so I could have a conversation and look at the same thing as my client when I'm talking to them. So it was about a deep care for what we did for clients rather than the, the perception, which was, well, you don't care about clients, you don't want you don't want to see them, you don't want to talk to them, you just want to do it all with technology. Um, so it's really interesting that we're now talking about the human firm and how we kind of create those greater connections. And this is a journey that we went on. So we started at online accounting. The term cloud accounting kind of came along as 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 zero entered the UK market and started kind of hockey stick growth. And we started to see the app ecosystem build around zero. So we were very early partners of Receipt Bank. Uh, in 2011, we were Go Cardless's first accounting partner in 2012. So lots of things that we did. And cloud accounting was really the unlocking of the opportunity where we say, well, hang on, if we can get clients photoing receipts and, and forwarding emails, and we can connect a bank account to our accounting data, then we can get data from clients on a daily basis that lets us completely redesign and redefine the services that we deliver, which was ultimately my purpose on day one. It's like, how do I change the way professional services are delivered? And the technology gave me the opportunity to do that. So we went through this period, kind of 2011 to 2017, where um, cloud accounting was being adopted. Um, and you get to a point where when you get the balance between the right technology, the right people and the right process correct, you create opportunity through greater capacity because you're, you're working smarter. So you can use that capacity to either think about delivering more services to the clients you've got, or you can start thinking about your marketing activity to win new business to, to enable you to grow as a business. And after I wrote the digital firm, I used this slide up and down the country and across the world, um, talking about the evolution, the journey that we'd been on. And I talked about what's coming next. And in 2018, I didn't quite know what it was. But where we got to is that I started to talk about the idea of the people firm or the human firm. So uh, we, uh, we are now at the, the human firm stage. But as we're going to discover during this session, you can't be a human firm if you're not first a digital firm. So I'm going to touch on what those two definitions are and what I mean when I talk about a digital firm uh, and a human firm. But the really interesting bit here, and I, I flagged this at the, at the event we did in May, if you look at that diagram there, um, my belief, and, and nobody's convinced me otherwise yet, we are at 20% adoption of cloud accounting technology in the accounting market in the UK. So that means that 80% of firms are not engaged um, with the whole concept of cloud accounting. So 15 years on from where we started our journey with cloud accounting technology, we are still early adopters. So if you are doing this now, uh, if you are thinking about using cloud accounting, if you're thinking about using pre-accounting tools, if you're using bank feeds, you are in the top quartile of accounting firms in the UK from a tech adoption point of view. And that astonishes people when I talk to them. But I assure you it's the reality of the situation. If we had more time, I'd talk you through some of the stats that I use to, to kind of reinforce that number. But happy to do that uh, with anybody that wants a conversation on that uh, at a later date. But the point is, the opportunity is still here for all of you to make a significant impact and position yourselves as tech leaders um, in the propositions that you offer to your, to your clients. So... I talked about this evolution being linear, but actually, as I wrote The Human Firm, it, it, it kind of dawned on me that actually um, uh, it, it's circular and we've gone full circle because 25 years ago, accountants had great relationships with their clients. We got invites to the birthdays, the weddings, the funerals. That was the depth of the relationships that we held with our clients. If you think about 
Um, it was about, um, David, I'm sure would know the answer here, but it was about 1987, um, uh, in certainly in, in England with the ICAEW, where the, uh, the, the ability for accountants to advertise and market themselves became a possibility. Up until that point, you weren't able to do it. You weren't allowed to advertise your services. So the way that you won business was by building relationships. It was the golf clubs. It was the, the networking events, whatever it was. But we created great relationships that created a stickiness and meant that clients stuck with us for, for in some cases, generations. But stuff changed. We, we landed in a regulatory compliance world where uh, you know all of the acronyms. We've had self-assessment. We've had RTI. We've had auto-enrollment. We've had GDPR. We've had MTD in various formats. So all of these things that meant our focus shifted from how do we keep clients out of jail? That that became the focus. Rather than how do we build great relationships, what are the things that we need to do to keep our clients compliant? And the focus became on those tasks rather than the relationships that we'd historically built. And then we drop into that linear section where for us as a firm, we went online, we went to the cloud accounting and we went to the digital firm. And actually what we've done now is the technology, the processes and all of the things that we've been able to, to do within our firm has enabled us to once again rebuild these really strong relationships that underpin everything that we do with the clients that we serve. But the best bit of this is that the relationships we have now are better than they were 25 years ago because they're powered by insight. So they're powered by the ability for us to be able to, to share real data. So they're informed conversations that we can have with our clients because of the way that we've been able to collate data um, and present it almost in real time to clients when when we talk about the challenges and things that they're facing. So I think we've gone full circle, but we are in a much better place now than we were 25 years ago because of what the technology has enabled us to do, which is why my belief is you can't do the human firm properly if you haven't first done the digital firm. So on, on that basis, what do I mean by a digital firm? So this was a definition that I used in 2018 in the first book. And I said that a digital firm is a firm that utilizes a mix of digital technology and digitally aware staff to deliver first class services efficiently and effectively through maximum levels of automation. So a couple of immediate observations here. Um, digital technology and digitally aware staff. So you can have the best technology in the world. But if your people won't use it, can't use it, don't want to use it, then it isn't going to work. So we've got to bring our people on the journey with us. We've got to recognize that it's not just about technology. We've got to have the right people doing the right bit of the process. The second point in here is it's about first class services. So it's about what do we deliver for our clients? How do we make sure that we're delivering the best possible service levels that we can to ensure that we're doing the right thing? So when we get all of this right, when we get the right people using the right technology, using following the right processes, we are going to be automating much of what we do and we're going to be doing that efficiently and effectively. So that's the objective for anybody that wants to be a digital firm. How do we get the blend of people, process and technology optimally aligned to ensure that we can deliver those great services to the clients that, that we serve? Um, if I had longer, I would take you through what I refer to as the digital firm wheel. Uh, these are the, the 10 components um, of becoming a digital firm. You'll see that client experience is at the heart of the wheel. The other things around the outside, how do we make sure we have the right strategy? Do we want to be a digital firm? What are the things we need to do to execute to enable that to happen? Thinking about the technology we use both internally and with clients. Thinking about the process. How do we build process? And the one thing that I always used to say when I talked about the digital firm is that you, if you can't control the process, you can't control the profitability of what you do. So process is really critical to make sure that we're bold enough to say to a client, this is a process that you should follow. Um, and people kind of challenge on that, but our clients pay us to give them advice. So we need to be confident. We need to have the mindset that says, you know what, our clients come to us to give them advice on the best way to do things. So we need to be bold enough to be prepared to say, this is what you need to do and why you need to do it.
Um, so we then get into marketing, thinking about um, brand and all of those those kind of things. Pricing. Um, so when I go in and work with with accountancy firms, they often think they want to talk about technology and process, um, but almost without exception, the two things we end up talking about are um, vision, values, and purpose, um, which is one thing, uh, and pricing, which is the other. So many firms struggle with pricing, so there's a there's a session in that in its own right. Thinking about the services we deliver through advisory, and then the last two that that kind of combine uh, a little bit is around people and culture, which we've expanded on quite significantly uh, in the human firm. So if we think about the next stage, which is is the human firm. Um, so this is this is still a very early definition, but the way that I think about a human firm, and, and we'll come on to this idea of balancing the client and the people in your firm. So for me, a human firm is a firm that's built a high performing team, and that team is committed to the purpose of the organization with a deep understanding of client goals and aspirations. So that's step one. We've got a great team that understands what we're trying to do as a business, which implies that as a business, you need to know what your purpose and aspirations are. All of our team members need to understand what our clients' goals and aspirations are. And in doing so, that enables us to deliver these leading world-class experiences to those clients. But this is where it gets really interesting because we've got to be able to do that without detriment to the goals and aspirations of the people that we employ. Because it's really easy. We focus really hard on what we want to do for clients. But we have to think and ask the same questions of our people. So if we're going to ask our client, where do you want to be in five years' time? We need to be asking those same questions to our people as well, the people in our team that are delivering on, on those services. So that's just the way that I'm thinking about the human firm now. And, and I'm going to come back to this as kind of the wrap-up at the end. But this is essentially the way that I see a, hu a human firm. So the top half of the wheel is all about the client and the bottom half is all about the team. And how do we get this balance right in delivering on our business's vision and purpose, but at the same time delivering those great client experiences that encompass all of those goals and aspirations that our clients have. So we're gonna revisit that as a wrap up at the end of the session. So thinking about, client experience and growth, because we're going to bundle these two things in together. And I said at the beginning that growing an accountancy firm is really easy. If you want to grow an accounting firm, what you need to do is you need to have a really good message and you need to communicate it really effectively. It's that simple. So why do you do what you do? What do you do and how do you do it? And if you can articulate that in a really good way, then you will win business. You will encourage people to come and talk to you and you'll engage them to, to become clients of your firm. That's growth. That's the easy bit. The challenge becomes you've got to live by what that message is. So if your message is that we're going to help you sleep at night by doing X, Y, and Z, um, and we're going to make sure you don't have HMRC knocking on your door because of X, Y, and Z, you've got to live and breathe that and you've got to deliver that. And if your message is effective, you'll grow very quickly. You'll have a flurry of people wanting to come and work for you. And it's very easy to become unstuck because if you don't think about the structures, the systems, the processes that you need in place to enable you to scale, which is the distinction here, then you're going to have a problem. So growth is easy. Scale is hard. Um, and when I talk about growth, and I'll come on to that in a moment, there are key points at your growth journey where you will, you will encounter new challenges. And I'll talk a bit about those in a while. So th the way that we deliver great client experience is through touch points, because the definition of, of client experience is the sum total of every touch point you have with a client from first contact to last contact. So the accountant in me hears the word sum and says, well, OK, if it's sum, the greater the parts, the greater the, the, the sum result. So therefore, how do we create really valuable touch points? And in terms of, of explaining this, I talked to lots of firms during COVID um, and, and lockdowns and all of that, that horrendous period that we had to me. My clients are really positive at the moment. They're, they're talking to me about how how kind of please their clients are with what they're doing for what we're doing for them and my question to those firms well kind of what are you doing different 
And they said, well, don't really know. Um, I mean, obviously, we're telling clients every every two weeks when the government give us an update, we're, we're, we're sending emails out, we're talking to clients, we're telling them how to deal with furlough, how to get bounce back loans, how to get C-bills loans. And that was the point, that these firms were talking to their clients every two weeks. And the result of that conversation every two weeks was that clients were were feeling more valued they were valuing the service that the accountant was delivering more so than when they heard from them once a quarter once a year uh, or whatever it might be so my challenge to those firms is well, what are you going to do so when the government stops drip feeding you stuff to talk to your clients about every two weeks what are you going to do instead how are we going to maintain those touch points so how do we think about building frequent touch points with a with a client and of course, the importance here is that, that touch points for touch point's sake can probably be damaging. So there's got to be a purpose behind those touch points. So we have to think about the services that we can deliver to enable us to have those valuable, regular client touch points. And, and anybody that's heard me speak before will know that, that I, I'm often accused of banging on uh, about the power of daily bookkeeping. And there's a number of reasons that we do daily bookkeeping. Firstly, because it's the way that the software we are being encouraged to use today, whether that's Sage, Zero, QuickBooks, whatever it might be, these pieces of technology were designed to be used in a way that we are delivering data every day. I did a webinar with Hamish Edwards uh, two months ago, who was one of the, the co-founders of Zero with Rod Drury. And, and Rod Drury said in a very early conversation, the reason they put bank fees into zero was to enable the small business user to be able to do a little bit every day. So be able to reconcile their bank account every day. So they know that they're uh, what they're owed and what they owe their suppliers. And I challenged Hamish in terms of has, has the user base lived up to the vision and the idea of what zero was about? And the fact that so many people are still doing quarterly bookkeeping, monthly bookkeeping, the answer to that is a resounding no, they haven't. Um, but I think that we we have an obligation. The way I think about this in terms of daily bookkeeping is, is if you're delivering bookkeeping services for a client, if you think for a moment, if you were employed as a, uh, as a bookkeeper or a financial controller uh, in a commercial organization and you didn't reconcile the bank account every day, how long would you keep your job? My guess is it wouldn't be very long. And if you're a small firm owner and it's your, your own firm, my guess is that you probably reconcile your own bank account fairly regularly. So if it's good enough for us, and if there's an expectation that in a commercial world, we would be expected to do it every day, why do we think it's okay as a, an outsource provider that we can do bookkeeping on a quarterly basis? So there's an argument there that bookkeeping should be done daily because it's the right way to do it, but equally it creates touch points. So whilst we process transactions daily for our clients, we position it to our clients as a weekly service. And because the last thing our clients want is us going and chasing them for £2.50 Tesco receipt uh, every day of the week. Um, so we position it as a weekly service. So every week we're going out to our clients and we're having a conversation with them. Now, don't get me wrong, that conversation has a purpose of we've got to find some missing information, but it creates an opportunity, a unique opportunity to say, how's business? How's your week been? What's going on? How, how are the family? How are the kids? That's about building these great relationships. So by delivering daily bookkeeping, we get great data, which gives us a better understanding of, of what our clients are doing and what the opportunities are for us to help them. And if we increase the value of what we deliver for clients, we, we increase our revenue and therefore make ourselves more profitable and enable us to grow as, as firms. And the point here is that I'm not saying for a second that we try and find stuff to sell to our clients. Our focus should be on how do we create more value? How do we deliver more value to our clients? The byproduct of delivering more value to our clients is that we're going to generate new revenue and more revenue. So daily bookkeeping is a really valuable way of doing it. And just as another example to this, uh, when I set my firm up in 2007, um, we were at a point where uh, as a firm, most of our payrolls were director only payrolls, which we could have filed once a year. We could have filed them all in March. But I took a decision, and this was kind of before I had any idea of what a human firm was or might look like. 
but I took somebody on to do payroll. And essentially I took them on so that once a month they would email a payslip to every client. And what happened in that is we would email a payslip and the client would email Vicky back and say, hey, Vicky, thanks for the payslip. Oh, and by the way, and that, oh, and by the way, is a great opportunity to have a conversation with your clients to think about the challenges they're facing. So this is about looking at one way, one service opportunity that enables you to get closer to your clients, build those relationships, create great experiences by creating those touch points that ultimately are going to get you into a position where you better understand what your clients are trying to achieve. Um, so I'm just going to do this the other way around. I'm going to show you this slide first. And this is a diagram that we used in, in the book, The Human Firm. And the idea here is, is recognizing this distinction between growth and scale. Because as I said earlier, growing is easy. Um, scaling is much harder. Uh, and what this diagram illustrates is that um, uh, if, you're, if you're not growing, you're, you're, a, you're an average sized balloon and you're sitting there and, and uh, if you're not growing, then the likelihood is you're not stagnating, you're shrinking. Um, uh, and, and using the balloon, balloon analogy, if you, your kids come home from a party and they have a balloon um, uh, a week or 10 days later, it looks less healthy than it did when they brought it home from the party. The other option is we can blow air into the balloon and we can make the balloon bigger. But you know what happens when you overinflate a balloon? It goes pop. Um, and when it goes pop, you have a big problem because if these balloons are, are lifting you up and taking you up into the air, when it goes pop, you fall very hard and fast to the ground. So the idea of, of scale is that rather than overinflate the balloon, we keep adding new balloons. And as a, as a mindset, it's about how do we build the structure that underpins scale? How do we build the processes? How do we do all of the things that mean if one of those balloons pop, it doesn't matter. There's enough that keeps us afloat and keeps us upright. And, and I've been in that overinflated balloon situation many times. Uh, and so many of the lessons that, that I talk about in, in the book are on the basis that, that we we grew without a focus or the right focus on scale. So one of the ways that we've done this, and I talk a lot about pod structures um, as uh, the optimum route uh, for, for firm structure. And I mentioned at the beginning that I'd touch on the, the, the points of growth where I see firms struggle. Um, and it happens at key points, give or take 10%. You will encounter challenges in growing your firm at the following points. Two members of staff. So we take on your first member of staff um, because it changes the dynamic. Uh, following on from that, eight people, 15 people, 23 people, 35 people, 50 people, 70 people, and I'm told 100 people. So these are points of growth where stuff just changes. These were the points that we encountered challenges but equally, I've spoken to enough firms that have gone through the same process and give or take 10%, every firm I speak to encounters headaches, challenges, growing pains around those trigger points. They can kind of overlay to revenue as well, but headcount is kind of the easiest way to do that. So I would be fascinated to know if anybody listening to this is at any of those points and, and can say, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm there and it's a right headache at eight people at the moment or nine people or seven people because that's probably where it's going to be. So the, the point at eight, the first challenge is what structure do we adopt? And we went through this as a firm and we said, uh, OK, so we need to create service lines. We need somebody that's going to do payroll. Somebody's going to do VAT. Somebody's going to do personal tax. Somebody's going to do accounts. But clients said, I don't know who to talk to. I used to talk to Will. I can't talk to Will anymore. I just don't know. So what we then did is we said, well, okay, we need to give people an individual point of contact. And we did that and we pitched it too low and clients would call and the person that, that was their appointed contact was too junior. Uh, they couldn't prioritize effectively what was important um, or they didn't know the answer and had to come and talk to us. So we then recruited more senior people and that became the start of what we now call a pod structure. So within the pod, we have a, a client manager um, a senior and two trainees at various levels. And our pods do everything with the exception of payroll. So they will do bookkeeping, accounts, VAT, 
personal tax um, for, for the directors of the companies that they look after. And broadly speaking, a pod can deliver about £300,000 of revenue. Um, so that in, in our world, and, and it's going to be different for everybody, delivers about a 60% gross profit margin. And that should be the target. So if your staff cost is higher, then the revenue target should be higher. But what we know with a pod is that it doesn't matter how many clients that is, it's a revenue number that's a driver. And what the pods enabled us to do from the scale point of view is every time we start to fill a pod, we create a new one. So we can move the, the senior into a client manager role. And it is probably one of the two things that has been most fundamental to our ability to grow at 30% a year, essentially as a firm, we're doubling every three years uh, in size in terms of, of headcount and revenue. And this structure, we've, we've tried tweaking it and every time we've gone back. So whilst I can't say it's perfect for everybody, we haven't found a better solution. And every firm that I've worked with has implemented pod structures and in 98% of cases, it's, it's worked successfully for them in the same way that it, that it has for us. So pod structures are really key um, in terms of helping you challenge and deal with those, those growth pains because this is the principle of scale. So how do we put in place a system and a structure that will enable us to scale effectively? So hope that makes sense. Normally pod structure is one of the areas we get questions. So if you've got any questions on that, um, do pop them into, uh, into the Q&A for us. So I've talked about the ideas of scale. I've talked about the points of growth where you will encounter problems. Um, uh, and the work that I do with firms is helping them kind of prepare for what that's going to look like and the things that you need to do. So let's talk a little bit about really knowing your client and the real purpose of KYC, because what I want to do here is just get you thinking about what's possible. We go through this process of doing the AML and the risk profiling and all of the other things that we need to do. But how often do we sit down and have that conversation with our clients in terms of, look, what is it you want to do? And how can we position ourselves to be bold enough to challenge the things that a client, a client tells us. So uh, James Ashford from GoProposal um, wrote the foreword for the, for the book. And in the book, he talks about a relationship that, that he had with his accountant's map in, in Manchester. Um, and the fact that they sat down for a planning meeting and uh, the, the, the accountants asked James, how many clients do you want this, in this next year? And James' response to that was, I want a thousand. And... They challenged it and said, well, why do you want a thousand? And James said, well, it kind of, it's a good number, isn't it? And they said, yeah, but, but why? What is it you want to do? Let's think about it differently. What would a good year look like? And James said, well, actually, if I'd love to take the, the kids to, to Lapland, um, see Father Christmas, and uh, I want my wife to give her job up. Um, so they did some numbers and said, well, well, actually, if you want to achieve that, you need, I can't know exactly what the number was, but let's say it's 683 clients. So the question there is, is how prepared would you have been to challenge that answer of, I want a thousand clients? Is but why do you want a thousand clients? What does a thousand clients, what, what do you think a thousand clients gives you? And what does that mean for you and your family? What's the impact that achieving that goal would have on, on you? So we have to find time and the right point in the conversation to be able to, to have those conversations with clients. How do we capture that information? How do we share it? How do we make sure the team understand what the clients are trying to do? And in doing so, we're able to continually reflect on those conversations through those regular touch points that we have as we, as we work through. So the key of, of this is that ultimately, if we don't know someone, we can't help them. It comes back to these relationships. It's like you've got to know what it is somebody's trying to achieve, what their aspirations are, if you want to help them. And if we don't know, then we definitely can't help them. And we may even be making assumptions that are counterintuitive to what they actually want to do. So how do we get to know our clients better? How do we encourage our teams to get to know our clients better? And as technology automates more of the the 
I used to term mundane, the, the, the stuff that we, that we have to do. And for many, many years, we've, we've made our livings from, and technology is going to automate more of the compliance activity. AI is going to drive more of that stuff. What are we going to do to enable us to, to, to build value in the relationships that we, we have with clients? And that starts with really understanding them again and having those, those conversations so that we can really drill into moving from just knowing our clients to really knowing our clients and being able to have those conversations on, on an ongoing basis. It's a major, major mindset but we have to start thinking about what the next five years looks like. What's going to change? What's technology going to do? How's it going to redefine the roles of what we do as accountants? What are the skills that we need from the accountants of the future? So bringing it all together in terms of what is a human firm? So as you, I flashed this up earlier, uh, so I'll drill into a little bit more detail and then we'll go to questions. So purpose the whole crux of, of a human firm is being crystal clear on what the purpose is for your organization. What's the grandiose plan, um, objective that you've got? How are you going to change the world? Um, and for me, it was about how do I change the way professional services are delivered and how do I change the perception that clients that use those services have of what we do? Um, and, and I'm really proud of what I've been able to do as, as, a, as a pioneer. I didn't design the tech that's enabled us to do it, but I've been able to deploy the tech in the way it was designed to be used to do that. And I'm extra fortunate that I get the opportunity to work with other great accountants and, and bookkeepers now to help them deliver those same kind of values to the clients that they serve. So understanding your purpose and your vision. So the, the vision is the next level down. So what's the three-year vision? What's the five-year vision? Purpose, my purpose hasn't changed from the day that I set it to right where we're at today. Within that, we're going to use that to drive these ideas of great client experience. Um, and in the outer circle there, in the red and green, I've got CVP and EVP. A CVP is a client value proposition. So this is a statement of what are you going to do for your clients and how are you going to do it? And it's the same thing for your employees. So you need to devise a one a, a kind of two sentence. This is who we are. This is what we do. And this is how we do it. And you need to do that for both your clients and your employees. So everybody understands what the purpose of the organization is. How do you want to be measured? Your values will underpin that. We have our values on our website. Um, and as much as I, I hate it when clients uh, are not happy, um, when clients say, I don't believe that your team are living up to your, your values on your website, that's really powerful. So being clear on what the expectations are uh, is a really valuable way of your clients being able to, to measure that and work with you. So if we break these two areas up and we've got technology and leadership around the outside, they underpin everything that we do. So very briefly, around the top, client insight. So reverting back to being a human firm is this idea that we can deliver great insight. We can use the technology, we can use the data that we collect to give real insight for our clients. Client need versus demand. I believe we have an obligation as accountants to help our clients understand the things they need rather than the things that they want. And they are different. So we need to help our clients understand why they need decent management information to be able to make the right decisions in their business. Thinking about clients as lifetime value, it's really easy and accountants are very guilty at saying, I've got a client and they're a 5,000 pound a year fee. The likelihood is you're gonna keep that client for between seven and 10 years. So a 5,000 pound client is a 50,000 pound lifetime value. That's before you deliver an increased value and increase the annual fee. So if you're looking at a client as a £50,000 client as opposed to a £5,000 a year client, how does that change the perception? How does that change the amount of investment you're likely to make into that relationship? And on the bottom half, it's all about career. It's about the culture that you create in your, in your business. What we know is we have generational shifts going on right now. We're seeing uh, Gen Z um, um, making up a significant part of our new workforce. We have to recognize that, that these Gen Zers and the alphas that are coming through now have come through senior school 
in a very framework driven way. So they they see what I refer to as competency frameworks in, in the workplace uh, within their education environment. You need to do this before you can do this. And if you do this, this is what happens. We need to think about how we map out and explain career opportunity. There's various stats that say two thirds of all millennials and Gen Z are going to leave their current employer within the next three years. That's not them. That's us. We've got to make sure that we can clearly define career opportunity. Um, these new generations will make decisions based on the values proposition that your business has, the way that you position yourself. Um, and we need to recognize that if we want to retain um, and win the best talent out there. Culture, uh, Charles Handy's definition of culture is where I always go to. It's the way we do things around here. It's really difficult to change culture, but we need to create a culture that, that is robust and relevant to what we're trying to do as a business. The bit that I want to talk briefly on is fan personality, because I think this is really interesting. And we can talk about culture, we can talk about brand. And I write in the book about the idea that I think firms need a personality because a person, a brand is static. A personality has the ability to evolve as you grow. We're a very different firm now than we were five years ago because we've almost doubled twice in that time. We make personality statements as a firm. We have a tone of voice that everybody in our business should be able to understand. Um, I'm sitting in, in a meeting room in our office, which is called the Tax and Pounds, um, and it's our, it's our office pub. Um, and uh, the, the desk that I'm using is the pool table that gets uncovered on a, on a Friday afternoon for people to have a game of pool. This is a personality statement. Um, it's not a brand thing. Um, and when we put the pub in in 2016, we lost a client. So a client said, I can't take seriously an accountant that has a pub in their office, which was kind of okay. That's, that's fine because they're, they're clearly not the right client for us. So Think about the personality. And particularly if you're in multi-partner firms, the risk is you have split personalities. You have multiple personalities. How can anybody really understand what you're about if you can't clearly articulate the personality of, of what you are as a firm? So um, in about 40 minutes, um, a, uh, a snapshot summary um, of why we should get to know our clients better focus on great client experience and how we do that through more frequent touch points why we have to focus on this idea of becoming a human firm and it goes back to that point at the beginning will we be replaced by the robots will ai replace us um yes if we continue to act like robots so how do we humanize everything that that we do firms that's a summary. As David said, the slides are, are going to be uh, available. Um, uh, the, the, the latest uh, is available back at uh, Kindle. Um, uh, if you uh, have managed to part of my voice for the best part of 45 minutes here, uh, there are another seven or so hours uh, on the Audible. Um, so uh, uh, I, I'd love to hear feedback uh, if you do have a copy of the book, if you've read the book, um, uh, but it is available. So, uh, David, um, back to you. Thanks very much, Will. That was, uh, as always, fascinating to hear and, you know, certainly resonates a, a, an awful lot with the the things that we hear within the ICAST practice support team in terms of the, the challenges that, fir that the firms have and, and, and that sort of thing. So I think, you know, maybe the first thing to pick up on is, um, you know, you talked an awful lot about client experience. Um, but I guess, you know, we often think of, of, of service level as being the, the, the thing that we strive for. And I guess, how, how do you see client experience and service level differing or are they the same thing? Uh, so I think, um, uh, so if, if anybody can remember back to their corporate strategy papers and, and things like that, we talk about critical success factors and delivering a good service is a critical success factor. Um, and, and what that means is it's the stuff we have to do to just be in business. So delivering a good service is something that we have to do. If we don't deliver a good service, we won't have a business. And I talk about this in a way that that 
the best thing about being an accountant is also the worst thing about being an accountant. And it's a thing called gross recurring fees. And what it means is that, that every year our clients come back. And the only reason they don't come back is if we mess up. So if we get something wrong, if we don't deliver a good service, um, because that's the bare minimum. Um, but what it means is the bar is very low. So the bar for service is is set very low because it in reality is like well, we've just got to not mess up. So as long as we file the accounts on time, we're not messing up. So it doesn't matter if that's a week before the deadline, that's that's still okay. Um, but it's not okay. And and this is where experience is a whole nother level. So experience is the bit that creates the the again using the strategy analogy and the strategy the distinctive competencies or the USPs, the things that we do better than everybody else. And that should be our, we should all be striving to do the best we possibly can for clients. And when I, when I talk about client experience, so much of it for me is about how do we make somebody feel? And I write in the book about the fact that do we make people feel confident, assured, um, uh, safe, um what whatever whatever it is but what are the feelings that 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 we kind of drive from the engagement that that our clients have with us as as professional advisors um uh, and and giving them confidence has got to be kind of number one on on that list but i mean i remember very early on in the business when we were kind of very early uh users on twitter and things people would kind of tweet that i never knew it could be so much fun meeting the accountant and and that's an experience service yep. that's somebody coming out and and feeling kind of fired up or whatever whatever it is that's creating a, a an experience for somebody um, and you know i talked earlier about the apple store that's the way i always talk about kind of experience it's like we we use amazon because amazon is quick and convenient and we can order something on a sunday and it arrives on a monday but when i buy an apple product i go into the apple store I go through all the grief of getting in the car, driving to the city, parking in the car park, going into the store when I could just click a few buttons on Amazon and have it delivered tomorrow. But it's because of the experience. It's it's a fact that you can touch stuff and there's more stuff than people and there's there's no real counters and uh, it it's just a great feeling to to be there. And that's experience. So how do we translate that into what we do as professional service providers? So I guess that, that, that's an element of your know, ex experiences, I guess, the external viewpoint of how, how we're perceived and service level, I guess, is how we look at things internally in terms of the, the delivery and the milestones and, and, and that, that, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, and I think if, if, we, if we focus on everything as an experience, though, because, again, you, if, you, if you take that internal view, what, is, what does good service look like? If we start from the client and say, what's going to make a client feel great um that might be knowing six months in advance what the corporation tax liability is going yep. to be so what that means is to deliver great experience for the client the service level has got to be we've got to deliver accounts within three months a year end so we have to start with the client outcome the client objective that we're striving to achieve to enable us to build the service level agreements or, or whatever that we want either internally yep or to share with our clients and say, look, our target is that three months after year end, we're going to deliver you your accounts. And this comes back to that process point I made, that if you're going to say to a, a client, our SLA is we're going to deliver your accounts within three months of year end, there is some stuff that the client is going to have to do to enable that to happen. And that's, that's us as accountants dictating the process and saying, we're going to do this in this timeline, but you need to do X, Y, and Z. And if you yeah. don't do that, then we're going to charge you more or, or whatever it, it might it might be. Yeah. Great. Uh, I want to come to, to another question which which has come in, which uh, I, I think is probably one that many firms uh, struggle with. They're, they're talking about, um, you know, they have what they call transactional clients um, yeah. where they do, you know, once a year touch point. They're, they're typically lower fees um, and, and it's it's sometimes hard i guess to justify spending additional time um developing that 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 relationship with them yeah how do you approach that type of transactional client uh so first of all it's a case of deciding whether that's the the clients that you want to be serving we have a choice 
we all have a choice in terms of who do we want to serve and it comes back it comes back to that purpose so what's your purpose um for your for your firm how do you want to be impacting the lives of of your clients and then the secondary thing is that that what we are we as accountants and i include myself in this as well because i did it for many many years is we're very guilty of making assumptions about what we think a client wants and it comes back to that point i made around need versus want um and until we have with client and say look you're you're ticking along you're doing 30 grand a year of of income is that enough what would happen if you could earn Fifty thousand pound a year. What difference would that make? And they might say, "I don't want to do that. That would mean more work. I'm quite happy at thirty grand." Okay, you've you've got an answer there. But it may be that, well, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to earn fifty grand. Um, so, okay, well, what do you, what does that what does that look like? I mean, what would that mean for you? And uh, we we have the abilities. Um, our, our training and our experience means that we can we can set a path for clients that that want to grow their their profitability and if that that individual was a was a tradesperson there's there's probably some very easy wins in terms of getting them to understand pricing better um getting them to understand diary management better um and using technology i mean i, I use an example of a a, a plumber that, that did some work when we renovated our house um he's now a client um because he was spending 250 pound a year on somebody to do his tax return. He was doing what most trades people do and, and he'd hit a glass ceiling because he didn't want to register for that. Um, in addition to that, he'd take a day off every month to do his, his invoicing and his bookkeeping. Um, and I said to him, what, what would you earn on a, on a, on a day if you were out doing jobs? And he said, I don't know, about 375 pounds. So he was spending 375 pounds a month to do his own bookkeeping. Um, uh, I think he pays us 250 pounds a month and, uh, and, and he doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, and he's gone beyond the VAT registration limit. And, and this is stuff that if we, if, if he was a client of ours and we hadn't had that conversation, um, he would still be ticking along, taking his day off and, uh, and everything else. And that's a client that was paying 250 pounds a year is now paying that a month. Um, yeah. So think about the clients, ask the questions, don't make the assumptions, um, uh, because until we ask the question, we don't know. That's, that's uh, great advice, Will, as, as always. Um, uh, uh, I see we've had a, a two minute warning flashing up on, on the screen here, <laughs> but there's one one further question that I do want to, to, to come to. And I love that that slide where you, you demonstrate the difference between growth and scalability. I just love that. I think it's just so powerful. But, you know, you talked about, um, you know, the pod structure. And that's quite often a, you know, a conversation that, that, that you have. I, I guess the question is, you know, a lot of our firms are traditional firms. They've, they've got that traditional set up in terms of the tax department, the, um, the bookkeeping department, the PAYE, the VAT, you know, whatever else. How easy is it for that type of firm to, to move to a pod structure? And what are, what are the pain points, I guess, within that? Um, uh, I mean, any, any change is difficult. So I'm not I'm not going to say it's easy, um, but it's it's getting clarity on on why why it's a better solution. And, and the, the one common denominator I have in every uh, in every firm that I talk to is that whoever you talk to in a firm is a genuine care for the client. It's kind of built into accountants DNA that we generally care on about the clients that we serve. So the point of, of driving through any change is position it in terms of the client. So what does a pod structure do for a client? How does that enhance the experience that those clients get? And, and the answers to that are continuity. It's the same people. It's, it's the, the ability for the firm to better understand because they're managed at, 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 at an individual team level. Um, and it's four people. I know that if one person's not there, somebody else is. Now we have a tax department. Um, and when a client needs specialist tax work, that's managed by the client manager in the pod. So they go to the internal tax team and uh, they provide the advice, but the client manager manages the, 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 the kind of the process and make sure that the things get done when they, when they say they should. So it's, it's a desire to do it. Um, and like any change, there's almost a case of, 
you kind of draw a line in the sand and you say, well, from today, this is what we do. Yes, there's some legacy stuff, kind of the other side of the, the line in the sand. And over time, we'll work out how we transition that over um, because you can't change everything overnight. But uh, mm -hmm. um, it enables scale. It delivers better client experiences, particularly if you're making a move to things like daily bookkeeping. You need a consistent structure to enable that to, to work effectively. So I know of large firms that have implemented um, pod structures in parts of their business. So they've taken what what becomes the outsourcing team or whatever uh, that's doing book that and yeah. accounts and everything else. And they create pod structures there and leave other parts of the business as, as they are. Yeah. Great. Well, we, we have run over time, but uh, as always, you know, so much to talk about and I'm sure we could go on for another hour or, 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 or more, but uh, we do have to, to, to draw this uh, session to a close. So once again, thank you very much, Will, for, for taking the time to join us uh, and, and, and talking us through all that. Um, as, as Will mentioned and as I mentioned earlier on, we will, of course, uh, put uh, the slides available on uh, the ICAS website um, shortly. And uh, please do remember that you can keep up to date with all the latest uh, information uh, through the ICAS website. You can access technical support through the ICAS technical help desk and uh, keep up to date with us on, on social media as well. Um, if you do want to deliver a great client experience, then you might be interested in the next ICAS webinar, which is on uh, 12th of October, when we'll look at first impressions for new clients and particular the letter of engagement process. Um, in this webinar, we will look at why letters of engagement should go beyond risk management and compliance, but also deliver that great client experience. So we'll be joined in that webinar by uh, Sean Smith, an accounting evangelist and as well as ICAS member Karen Kennedy of Kennedy Accounting, who has streamlined her engagement process uh, using Sage Oversuite to learn and learn why this is such an important area. We've also got a range of other webinars and other events, uh, which are all listed on the screen there. Links to sign up to all these webinars and events are available at icast.com forward slash events. So it only leaves me to once again, thank you, Will, uh, and of course you, the audience, for joining us today. I hope the webinar has been helpful to you. And until next time, goodbye. <laughs>